Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're glad you're here with us uh, virtually. We're in uh, the book of Ezra, uh, the fourth chapter, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 5 in just a moment. If you remember what's happening, Ezra, the, the exiles, the, the, mostly the descendants of those who were taken into exile with the destruction of, of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, by Nebuchadnezzar, have returned. King Cyrus the Great has issued an order that they would go back to Jerusalem and that they would rebuild the temple, rebuild the city, and worship God there. And so they have begun the process. They have laid the foundation for the temple. They have uh, built the first altar and they have uh, begun the the sacrifices and the worship of God that was that this place was designed for because they are there to establish a worshiping community, a group of people, a family of people who would worship God and the way he had commanded them to do so, who would honor him and be reminded every day that they were his own people. In this chapter, particularly in this passage, we're going to start reading about the opposition that they're starting to face from the inhabitants of the region. You see, Jerusalem was no longer deserted. It had been totally wiped out by the Babylonians, but people drifted in from the north, from what used to be the country of Israel. If you remember your biblical history, uh, the, the kingdom of Israel was united under just two kings, David and Solomon. And then after Solomon's death, there was division because one of his sons was a bit of a jerk. And the northern ten tribes separated themselves from the kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Judah was centered around Jerusalem. It, it comprised of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The other ten tribes of Israel formed the kingdom of Israel, or it's sometimes referred to as Ephraim in the scripture because that was the largest and most important tribe there. But that kingdom was destroyed in 722 BC um, because, well, two reasons. The, the most important is because they had ceased honoring God in the way they should. They worshiped many other gods and had many false gods and idols before them. And so God allowed them to be destroyed. The, the human reason it was destroyed was that they had rebelled against the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians were, at that time, the strongest empire in the Middle East. They came in and just wiped them out. Not, didn't kill everyone. They deported them. And instead, they imported people from other parts of their empire, which stretched from what is now modern-day Turkey into through modern-day Iraq. They took people from other parts of the empire, and they brought them in to Israel to repopulate it, to intermingle with the, some of the tribes of Israel who remained. They would become, over time, what we would call the Samaritans in the New Testament. But, but these people are, are there during the time of the rebuilding of the temple, and they're going to start causing problems. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 1. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the family heads and said to them, Let us build with you. For we also worship your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time King Esarhaddon of Assyria brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the other heads of Israel's families answered them, You may have no part with us in the building of a house for our God, since we alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people who were already in the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build they also bribed officials to act, to, to act against them, to frustrate their plans throughout the reign of King Cyrus of Persia until the reign of King Darius of Persia. Now that's a period of about 30 years that they're talking about here. And what we find is an opposition to the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem 
from those who had already come into the region and now considered it their home. And it had been their home for generations, for at least 40 years. And so we have to ask ourselves a question. Why not let them help build the temple? In our day and time, we, we look at inclusiveness as one of the cardinal virtues. But God is exclusive. And that doesn't mean he doesn't want people to come in. It means that he has conditions that must be met before people become part of his worshiping community, part of his spiritual family. These people were enemies of the exiles. That's what it says right there in that first verse, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple, they came and wanted to have a part of it. They were not on the same page. They were not on the same wavelength. They were not thinking about God in the same way that the, that the exiles were. The ones who had returned from exile had been convinced by the actions of God that he was the only God. Israel, Judah, when they went into exile, had been struggling with uh, their monotheism. They had started adopting other gods. God punished them in the exile. And when they returned, they believed that there was only one God. Only one God. And it was Jehovah, the Lord of Israel. When these people come in and want to help, they say this, look, for we also worship your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time King Esarhaddon of Assyria brought us here. There's some things in that statement that help us realize why Israel excluded them. They also worship, not as it means that they, along with the exiles, worship God, but it also could mean and probably does mean that they worship God also along with the other gods that they had brought in with them. They were probably not monotheistic. They were, like most of the people at that time, polytheistic. They worshiped God, uh, the Lord God and others as well. Uh, it was common in, in this, that pagan time for people to sort of try to cover their bases, to worship every god they could just in case one of them could help. The people of Jehovah should never be that way. We believe there is only one God, and he deserves all of our religious devotion, all of our uh, obedience, all of our love, because he is God. These people were bringing in corruption to the true, pure, solitary faith that the Lord, he is God. You remember what Jesus said, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall worship him, love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That was to be the core of Israel, of Judah, a people who loved God alone. These enemies the inhabitants of the land, may have worshipped God, but they didn't worship God the way God desires. At the beginning of the Exodus, when God brought Moses up onto Mount Sinai and gave him the Ten Commandments, God said this. It's in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 3 and going through verse 6. Do not have other gods beside me, do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow in worship to them and do not serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. God is exclusive in the sense that he 
blesses those who love him alone. No other gods. This is an essential part of the faith of the true Israel and an essential part of the Christian faith that we have had inherited from our Savior. That we cannot accept within the worshiping community those who are worshiping other gods because they will inevitably corrupt the true worship of God. You see, we as, as Christians, we have a gospel imperative. We have an, ev an evangelistic imperative. We're to go out and we're to win the world to faith in Jesus Christ. But that faith must be in Jesus Christ, who is the God of Israel, Father, Son, and Spirit. Our faith must be in the one true God. We cannot accept within the church those who worship other gods as well as our God. Because you see, if you worship other gods as well as the Lord, you are not truly worshiping Jehovah, the Lord, the God of Israel. Because he is unique and solitary, and he alone is worthy of worship. These Jewish people, returning from exile, knew that. They had seen in their time in exile shining examples of that among their own people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These people knew who Daniel was. They, they knew his story. They knew his faithfulness. And they returned, having heard the prophecies of Ezekiel and his call to faithfulness. They remembered what Jeremiah had said before about God. And they came back convinced that there was only one God. And they had the wisdom to know that they could not accept within God's worshiping community those who worshiped other gods as well. You now, I admit to our worldly standards and that seems harsh, unkind, exclusive, but they had a purpose from heaven and that was to preserve purely the truth of who God is, which they accomplished. They had a purpose to become a people who would produce a savior for the world, which they accomplished. And in accomplishing that, they made enemies. And they would not accept the enemies into their own camp, not because they had a hard heart towards people, but because they had a soft heart towards God. God comes first. Always, God comes first. And they recognized that. And as a result, they were opposed. These people whom they rejected wrote letters to governors and to influential political appointees, and they did everything they could to hinder the building of the temple, to hinder the building of the walls that would come later, to hinder God's work but they were not successful. My well, brothers and sisters, when we're trying to do the work of the Lord, we will meet hindrance as well from those who oppose us and dislike what we're saying because we do proclaim a strong message. We proclaim that all human beings are sinners, that we are not perfectible in and of ourselves. We cannot in and of ourselves do enough good to earn eternal life. We believe there is only one way to God, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice and through his resurrection. And we proclaim an exclusive truth. Now, we welcome anyone who will believe that to be part of the Christian church regardless of race, regardless of language, regardless of culture, if they will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will welcome them as brothers and sisters. 
But if they bring in false gods and say, I'm going to worship Jesus and I'm going to worship uh, Allah and I'm going to worship the my ancestors and the ghosts that are living in the trees and this crystal and this rock, then that we cannot have in the church because we are the people of the Lord. And he is a jealous God. He desires our love, our worship, our devotion, unadulterated, pure. Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the others understood that. Their answer, you may have no part with us in building a house for our God. They understood that they had an exclusive relationship with God. Through the, the law, through their inheritance from Abraham on through Jacob. They had an exclusive relationship with God. And we as believers in Christ have the same. We welcome anyone, anyone, who will put their faith in Christ to join with us. But to join with us, you must have faith in Christ. And that's the simple truth. Do we exclude people? Not because of who they are, but we will exclude people for what they believe or what they don't believe. Not in the sense that we'll drive them out of the building with chains and whips, but they cannot be a part of the body if they do not have a relationship with Christ. That was true then. They didn't, if you don't have a that covenant relationship with God, they could not be part of the worshiping community. It's true now. If we do not have that saving relationship with Christ, we cannot be part of the worshiping community. But the good news is that anyone, no matter how sinful, no matter how much wickedness we've done, how much depravity has been in our lives, anyone can be forgiven if they would just call on Jesus with faith, believing that he is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, believing that he can and will save you. When you commit your life to following him, serving God the Father, God the Son, in the power of God the Holy Spirit, you become part of God's family. Throughout our study in the book of Ezra, I've referred to these exiles returning as a worshiping community. I've been using those words in everything for a purpose because that is what they were. They came together to worship the Lord. The word community in Latin, the com is a, a prefix meaning with, unity, oneness, with oneness, with one purpose. A community is a, is a people who are united in a purpose. And the church, this church and every church of the Lord Jesus is a worshiping community. We have one purpose to lift high the name of God, to exalt him in praise, so that the world may know who Jesus is, and that they may come and join with us through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never put that faith in Jesus. You've never trusted him with all that you are. You can do that right now, sitting at home, holding your phone or looking, watching your computer. You can right now pray and give your life to him, believing he is the one Savior. 
the true God. And if you'll do that, then you can become part of the community of Christ. Find a local church. If you're here in Edgewater, we're at 3232 South Ridgewood. Come see us. If you're anywhere else, find a good church that preaches the gospel and be a part of that community. There is a commonality, there is unity, there is love among the people of God. Be a part of it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've given us purpose, that you've given us your Son, that you've given us your Spirit. We lift up your name, O God, Jehovah, the Lord of Israel, and through the sacrifice of Christ, the Lord of the church. And I pray, Father, that our lives may be lived in devotion to you, that you would forgive us where we become selfish and turn toward our own ends and restore us and help us to live a life that brings honor to your name. Be with all those who hear these words. Bless and strengthen us. And we ask this in the precious, holy, and powerful name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. If you have a prayer need, you can send an email to bellavistabcprayer at gmail.com and we will read it and we will pray. We'll get back to you and let you know we've done so. Have a great week. Hope to see you Sunday. Bye-bye.